You know, there really are only two types of people in this world. Only two, he said. And a lot of this might have to do with two things. One, a former Cardinals quarterback signing with the division rival 49ers, who happens to have an aerospace engineering degree. And then what Danny Sarek thought for a hot moment might have been a UFO sighting. Because Darren Urban, there are only two types of people, those who believe in UFOs and those who do not. Darren, Paulie. UFOs do not count as aliens on your bingo card. I see you. I don't have... I don't have aliens. Oh, just no. There, no. There's oh. no way you're reaching. Am I that predictable over here? I just you, have aliens. I'll, I'll add UFOs next time. Yeah, that, that'll, no, that qualifies because yeah, uh, it, I, I, do believe, I do believe in both. So that I, does qualify. I did, yes, I did see what I later learned was, I guess, the SpaceX launch of something, which I guess happened in California. I could see it from my apartment balcony, which I didn't know what it was at first. And I saw it and it looked really pretty in the night sky and then across the street all these cars were pulling over to look at it too and then i later learned that was what it was you sound disappointed a no bit. i just i i i mean i thought it'd be not something cooler because that's pretty cool um i don't know darren is a longtime resident of the ac uh, yes that would be me paul did you or did you not see the phoenix lights circa 1997 i did not see them but i very much remember that time yes. did you ever believe that those were extraterrestrial because there was a lot made, there is still a lot made of the Phoenix Lights. In fact, the UFO Congress that would come to the Valley every year in Fountain Hills was so big, it actually relocated a few years ago to the Phoenix Convention Center. And there's a whole section of that display devoted to the Phoenix Lights and whether or not here's, here's, it was otherworldly. Here's my, my issue with the UFOs and the aliens, Paul. Why, why wouldn't we have something more concrete by now? <laughs> Maybe we do. It's all a secret. Yes. Okay, but again, Didn't how? Congress come out and say that aliens yep. were real like yep. a couple months well, ago? <laughs> and they just put out some of everything that supposedly was in the storage in Area 51. Uh, no, there's nothing to see here, people. Just move on. Okay. So what, do they just kill everybody that potentially could say anything? I'm like, yeah. that's... It's uh, a good point. It, it, one of the things Valid that always point. bothers me about conspiracies like that is like, do you realize how many people would have to never leak in something? Right. That that makes no right. sense. That's right. If an NBA game or NFL game was fixed and the referees, oh, guess what? Uh, there would be someone in the know. Yes. And that would be leaked at some you point. Can't, the, the mob can't kill yeah. everybody. Yeah. So anyway, I thought I'd throw that out there. A, because of Danny's sighting, and then B, you know, Josh Dobbs signing with the 49ers. Because... I did ask him one of those weeks, Josh, do you believe in UFOs? And he went into like a two-minute explanation and at the very end. I'm pretty sure the answer was no, but yeah, it was so it, complicated. It was, no. it was no, wasn't it? So It was no, and, and but, I mean, the guy is smart enough yeah. to have actual reasons for saying no. And I throw that out, out there also as a little segue into the whole quarterback question around the league because we have seen a carousel. It's not just Josh Dobbs with the Niners. From the top, because I know you want a refresher, Darren. It's Kirk Cousins with Atlanta, Russell Wilson with Pittsburgh, Justin Fields now with Pittsburgh for a six, what might be a four, Jacoby Brissett in New England, Jameis Winston in Cleveland, Gardner Minshew in Vegas, Tyrod Taylor with the Jets, Drew Locke with the Giants, Marcus Mariota with Washington, Mitchell Trubisky with Buffalo, Sam Darnold with Minnesota. I love it when Paul gets into his purge mode and he starts rattling off whatever no, it is no it's a and and i bring this up because uh, moments ago i happened to MC this event a golf event and and monty Asenfort got up there and was addressing the crowd and i threw at him you know monty um <clears throat> there's a different mock draft seemingly every day and the latest greatest is daniel daniel jeremiah 3.0 nfl.com mm -hmm. and the minnesota vikings need for a quarterback leads to a cardinals trade Taken 11 and 23. Wait, you brought this up in public? I threw it out to at him. To the GM? I threw it out at him because I asked him, you know, how often do you run in these – now, did he answer that whatsoever? Absolutely not. But he did share a funny anecdote that he was in church with his teenage daughter, and the pastor brought up, what will the Cardinals do at number four? Nice. And Does the pastor know he's in that church? And yeah, I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay. And, and Monty's like, okay, is this really happening at this point? So just imagine being the GM of an NFL team who, right now, if you figure the top three are most definitely going quarterback, and Chicago is, after training away Justin Fields, are the Cardinals not at the pivot point of this draft? All the power, all the leverage. Which we kind of knew. I, is it me? And maybe yes. it is just me. It probably is just me. But I feel like 
And I don't know if it's because of the quarterbacks or because Marvin Harrison is a little bit more sexy of a name, but like I feel like there's more consternation and uh, and debate over what the Cardinals are going to do at four than there was when they were at three last year. I don't feel like it was that crazy last year, was it? I feel like I'd be on the same page as you, thinking back and and comparing at this point. You want to know what does kind of bug me, though, So even though you didn't ask, Paul? Oh, I tried go. to do a mock draft simulator. Oh, yeah, she was pretty ticked off. And I didn't even do the mock draft. W- what do you mean? Well, Isn't this like the 1800th time you've yes. done that? Well, here's the thing, is I was trying to do my own version of Daniel Jeremiah's trade. Okay. And I'm not going to put which draft simulator website I was using on blast. But I try to do the trade where the Cardinals trade four and then from Minnesota get 11 and 23. And Minnesota kept rejecting my trade. They wanted more. And finally, I was like, I'm not even doing this trade anymore. She was very mad at the fake Minnesota Vikings. I was. See, See, that's why I'm not cut out to be a GM because I'd be like, you know what? I'm done. You lost your chance. I'm mad because I want more if I'm the Cardinals in just 11 and 23. If we're giving you your franchise quarterback at four, there needs to be a little something extra in there, a little bit. Something for 2025? Yeah. I mean, Cardinals, uh, so to speak, need to wet their beak more than just 11 and 23 if you want to go mafia terms because according to Daniel Jeremiah, although this is a pretty good haul right here, Cardinals take Jared Verse at 11, Brian Thomas Jr., the receiver out of LSU, 23, and then Byron Murphy, the D-tackle out of Texas, number 27. I mean, you know, it's hard to argue with that haul in the first round. If that's what it becomes, did you see Chris well, Sims? Chris but- Sims knew, by the way, Chris Sims knew wide receiver rankings, and he's right up there as a as a hot take artist this time of year. Very hot takey. <laughs> but he has Brian Thomas, the number two rated receiver on his board, behind Malik Neighbors. Yeah, I saw that. The LSU teammates one two Marvin Harrison Jr. three. Maybe, maybe not. I I, I will say that it does seem. I mean, if you're the Cardinals and you went from three to twelve, and you got obviously twelve, which would be the eleven for the Vikings, but you got a first round pick next year and what was it, a second round pick? I believe they got out of that deal. I missed that. Is there is that was that part of the trade that Daniel Jeremiah? No, broke no, no. Down? I'm saying no. I'm talking about last year's oh, deal with gotcha. the Texans. Yep. In terms of how much they were getting. Like, I, I definitely feel like they need to get more than just yes. the two first-round picks. Because Maybe that's why Minnesota kept rejecting my trade. They wanted me to ask for more. I'll try again tomorrow. No. That's right. They were mad you weren't asking for more. Because you know what? Based on last year, you're absolutely right, Darren. Based on last year, you have to have insurance. What if? Look, Minnesota has a pretty talented roster. This isn't a reclamation project. Two years ago, they won 13 games. Now they went 11-0 and in those one-score games, and they went to the playoffs. Remember, because we were all in Minnesota for the training camp session. And the Vikings, um, I'll just say this. You guys can agree or disagree, and I know you will. Walking around that Vikings complex, which was very nice, but there was sort of a sense of um, everyone involved with the Vikings, a little bit haughty, if you will, right? Kind of smelling themselves coming off that playoff win. I just know that I was hot. It was so warm oh. and humid oh. when yeah, we that went. Was, that was pretty harsh. I mean, we complain about the heat here. 98 different. with 92% humidity. Uh, death is what that was. Uh, all right, real Awful. quick, to revisit, the Cardinals last year gave up the third overall pick and a fourth round pick. What they got back was first, the 12, a first this year, so the, the next year, a second round pick, which was the first pick of the second round, and a third round pick this year. So they could definitely get more than They definitely should get more 23. If, if they're gonna yeah, I think they should, yeah. Well, that wasn't the first pick of the second round, because the first pick of the second round last year was Joey Porter to the oh, then, Steelers, right? Then that's right, because somebody lost a first round pick yeah. or whatever it was. But it but, was a thirty third pick overall, but which I, would normally be the first pick of the second round. So we agree. Cardinals need more than what they got last year. We if it's a similar agree, target trade. We love each other here on Cardinals <laughs> Underground. You know, because you found out the hard way the risk in not knowing where that first round pick is going to wind up. When stinking CJ Stroud comes out of nowhere with an epic rookie season, only five interceptions, and the Cardinals had three of them in one game? How does that happen? And then all of a sudden, 
they end up with the offensive and the defensive rookie of the year. And they go from the worst record over the previous four years combined to a playoff win with a rookie head coach and a rookie quarterback. So, again, Minnesota, if that's a team that looks poised to move up, and the Vikings do look poised to move up, and once again, if you go by the Jimmy Johnson trade value chart that's been in existence for some 40 years, 11 and 23 equate to somewhere between number three and four Mm. in the draft. So technically it should be enough. So technically, but based on last year, I think that's where Monty says, okay, Minnesota, guess what? You can use that. But look what happened to us last year. And guess what? I've got Denver on the line. I've got the Giants on the line. I got the Raiders on the line. We need more. Or else you're out. So for everything that happens on a daily basis in the mock draft world, and by the way, Monty reiterated how he uh, he doesn't pay attention to any of that stuff. He doesn't have time for that kind of stuff. Um, I, I do Who's surmise, got time for any of that stuff? I do surmise his phone is going to be ringing off the hook over the next month don't you think he said himself he was going to be making some phone calls as well you know one of my first thoughts was after seeing daniel jeremiah's 3.3.0 mock draft was oh my gosh if the cardinals have three first round picks the day after that friday of the draft when they all arrive and we do all this content and the interviews (laughs) (laughs) oh my gosh this would be the longest day (laughs) Ever with three first round draft picks. That's where my mind went. Three first round draft picks and getting ready for four, the draft. Four more picks that day. Yeah, but Danny, you're regular season ready. You just did a half dozen free agents in a row on the did. you know on the TV studio, right? I did. Boom, that was under, in there and... under the weather too. So <laughs> yes, if, that's right. if something seems a little off. Yep. You taped an aspirin on it <laughs> and you just you, you got it done, all those interviews one after another. Here's the other thing I'm gonna throw out there. How much importance do you think? that Monty Asifor and Jonathan Gannon attached to the receiver position. Mm. Do you think... Did you hear something at the golf tournament no. we need to know about? Absolutely. In terms of what? Once again, my, my key card doesn't get me, never has, never will, into the war room. No one's saying anything, poker face all the way around. I'm just... This sort of team they're building, the sort of mentality they're building, the run game they showed last year, I just wonder, do they even attach number four overall? to a receiver. I could see him spending number four overall on an edge rusher, on a D tackle, a lineman, a quarterback, but receiver? I think it just comes down to best player available. And I think the way this draft falls, while an edge rusher would be great, I haven't seen any analyst or mock drafts have an edge rusher as high as four. Now, if the Cardinals trade down with that fourth overall pick and you're hitting more of that middle range of the first round or using a later pick, I've seen those. I think it comes down to best player available, which is why we're seeing so many mock drafts with wide receivers and tackles. I get where you're going at. It's very clear that Austin Fort values the trenches, and that's where the game is won, at the line of scrimmage. So it would make sense. It wouldn't be much of a surprise. I would still think, I almost feel like the moves that they've made show that they are valuing one of these top receivers of making sure you have enough of the supplemental pieces, and then you're probably going to draft, to me, how I'm reading the tea leaves, is you're going to draft one of these top receivers to come in and be an immediate game changer. But if you got a Brian Thomas in the second half of the first round, I mean, he's 6'2", he ran a 4-3-3, he had 17 touchdown catches beyond Malik Neighbors at LSU. That, to me, is still prioritizing and valuing, though, a wide yeah, receiver because Thomas is still going in the first round. You'd still use him. So th- that, to me, is still valuing a wide receiver. I think that they are doing a nice job at putting having the foundational pieces either at wide receiver or on the offensive line to kind of set themselves up for success at whichever way the draft falls for them. I w- I, when you presented the question, my thought was the same as Danny's. is like, okay, do they value? So are you saying, like, late second round, third round is where they would go get the receiver. If you're getting somebody, to me, in the first round or the early part of the second round, you're still valuing a receiver. I guess I'm talking – I really was intending the number four pick overall. Okay. The the rarefied air of top five. Because at that position in the draft, it better be a generational receiver. Does it alarm you at all that Marvin Harrison Jr. is not the number one receiver on a lot of these draft analysts' boards? That there are a lot of mock drafts that have Malik Neighbors coming before okay. Marvin Harrison Jr. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm Shouldn't gonna, it be a slam dunk? I guess is what I'm saying. I'm gonna say that we are to 
as if mock draft isn't always silly season, we are officially to silly season mock draft. Even Daniel Jeremiah kind of hinted at it and his latest thing goes, okay, we're going to get crazy here. I think people get bored. I mean, nothing has changed. And yet these people still have to put out versions 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, 6.0. Nothing has changed. The, okay, some free agency. But really, if teams are doing it right, that isn't going to impact it that much. So especially at the top of the draft. So I'm going to argue that when you say, well, some of these mock drafters don't even have. I, I think people are just screwing around it's, at this point. Well, same with quarterback. Yeah. Since the combine, all of a sudden, J.J. McCarthy is. And and, True. and and I would yeah. I would also say that uh, again, when we when we start talking about you, you're like, would they do that at number four? I mean, is Marvin Harrison generational? We're not going to know that. But let's say they stay at four and they take Dallas Turner, who is probably the top edge rusher, but nobody sees him go in top five. I mean, if that guy comes in and gets you seven sacks a year for the next five years. You mess that up too. I mean, yeah. there's there's no yeah. guarantee just because you're not taking a receiver that the guy you do take is going to be awesome. And I'm not talking about you know some guy running some blog in his basement. I, I mean, I'm talking about like when Daniel Jeremiah, well, who is he? Tweets out, just I wouldn't kidding, Daniel. I wouldn't be shocked if Neighbors ended up being the first wide receiver off the board, and he's citing yeah. personnel people in the league. And he's saying, I guarantee some teams will have neighbors at the top of the list. Now, are some of these teams giving them bad information just because it is silly season it's and there's screen. all the uh, oh, you know, okay. subterfuge. I, but there's a, I mean, there's a lot of draft reports I've read. Yeah, there are a lot of opinions people have been evaluating receivers for a long time that have neighbors and Marvin Harrison neck and neck. So my question isn't okay, which is better. My question is, if you're going to take a receiver at four, shouldn't it be an absolute slam dunk? So you're saying if two guys are potentially generational instead of just one, you're taking neither? What that doesn't odds? make any sense to me. What, okay. what are the odds, I, I guess? That... And I'm also going to say this. I, I, I don't doubt that there are people out there. I mean, I, I forget who it was, but there's a story out there that there was somebody who had a third-round grade on somebody who ended up being unbelievable for the Cardinals at one point. And supposedly a scout that had a third round grade on him, but forget that for a moment. I was having this discussion with somebody who has covered the team or, or uh, covered football for a very, very long time the other day. And we were talking about uh, it was those reports that came out that said, well, there's definitely a couple of teams that have neighbors as the number one receiver on their board. And he was like, why, why would anybody tell anybody that? And you can't, it's really hard to get past that. It feels like, because I know Danny is a big Seinfeld fan. Um, it, it feels like, um, remember the George Costanza opposite episode? I don't know if oh, you are. Yeah. So, Absolutely. So the one where he's like, I'm going to do every, I, I'm going to take my instinct and always do the opposite. And if you, if, if somebody says out there, well, I, I've been told that a couple teams have, Neighbors is number one. My first thought is, well, then they don't have them number one. They're lying. Yeah. Well, what if you're picking in the bottom of the first half of the, you know, the first round? I mean, what if you're picking way and you have no shot at either guy? I mean, would you be loath to share to share real intel? What if you're picking somewhere between twenty and thirty and you have no shot at the? I guess so. That'd be my only point. But yes, you're absolutely right. Costanza. I think Monty Asifor just pulled a Costanza. Remember the scene where he he walks up to the supermodel and says, "My name is George. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents." Yeah, I think that's the opposite right. episode. Right. Yeah. And she agrees to a date with him, right? Because he does the exact opposite of what he'd be inclined to do. Right. This the totally absurd. But if you're Monty Asifor and I'm looking at my list of free agents and the guys you did sign, Danny, and you talk to every one of them, if I'm not mistaken, they all have a long track record of durability. Something the Cardinals did not get out of most of their free agent class a year ago, especially the defensive linemen. And linebackers. I would think that's a huge trait that was looked into when it comes to free agents is the durability, the reliability, and, and that consistency that you are able to bring. And I think that, yes, these might not be the biggest names. They might not be the sexiest free agent signings. What the Cardinals want to do 
is not the same as what other teams want to do. And when it comes to something like the defensive line specifically, we know that defensive coordinator Nick Rollis wants to have a rotation. That doesn't make sense to bring in a big star defensive tackle that's going to take a ton of your money and a ton of your cap space if he's going to be on a rotation and you're not going to be getting the snaps of what is equivalent to what you're paying him. I think that the moves make sense. And when you're looking at the durability, when you're looking at the offensive line signings, versatility, Jonah Williams. I mean, the fact that we're already having a conversation of possibly being on the left or right side is honestly a great discussion because he has that flexibility that he can go on either side. And it's I think it's going to come down to what the coaching staff wants to do with Paris Johnson Jr. And then you kind of work your way around there. But I think versatility and durability were key points in the free agency signings. And also with the linebackers, that was hit pretty big with the injury bug and bringing in Mac Wilson. Paul, were you sad when uh, the defensive lineman Jonah Williams signed with the Vikings and, and didn't didn't I, end up coming to the Cardinals so we the Cardinals could have two Jonah Williams. Okay, I'm going to uh, I'm going to come clean. I did speak that into existence. I uh, I said something out loud that I hoped would come to fruition meaning some other team please sign the second Jonah Williams. We don't need to deal with that all year long. So, That's thankfully. Fair. Jonah that, Williams that, on Jonah Williams. Yeah, we did we did just didn't practice need that. photos. Yeah, oh, that. chef's kiss. Uh, what would sorry, I guess the jerseys would just be the same cuz it's different numbers. It wouldn't be like J Williams. <laughs> That'd be the same. No, it I wouldn't mean, be Jay <laughs> Williams. <laughs> I just thought right? that was a great pause. I I, I don't know. That's a great question. Then again, how I many? I guess it's not our not our worry anymore. For, for those of us who have to deal with the rosters in the preseason, there's a lot of pre you know a lot of teams in the preseason. They have two number twenty ones on offense and yeah, defense, and then that gets crazy on special teams. Which one is it? And yeah, so so uh, Monty Osenfort was just yeah. looking out for us. So the Cardinals got Jonah Williams, who was the former 11th pick overall in the 2019 draft. The left tackle, who, like D.J. Humphreys, didn't play a single game of his rookie year. This was due to injury. Then he started three years at left tackle, played last year uh, every game at right tackle. And he has five games worth of playoff experience. But he actually graded out better at right tackle than he had the previous year at left tackle. Jonah Williams, combined with the fact NFL Network is reporting that Paris Johnson Jr. is going to left tackle, I guess I'm going to operate on that premise going forward. Uh, but overall, he got, what, $19 million guaranteed over two years, which was the most. No, check that. Justin Jones got 19.75 reportedly, well, over three years. And then Bilal Nichols, 14.4 over three years. But those, but the guarantee, those other two, those weren't guarantees, were they? I had uh, oh, were Jonah they? Williams at $19 million guaranteed over two years. Yeah, but what was the other one? Those were guarantees over three years? Over okay. three years, yeah. A little bit more for yep. Justin than I thought, but there was so much stuff going on last week. Sean me. Murphy bunting, you know, 17.5 guaranteed over three years. The corner, you know, it's a lot. Of, look, in this day and age of inflation, which has hit the NFL as well, look at some of the insane salaries going to the premier elite defenders, Christian Wilkins and other guys. I mean, these, this was sensible shopping, was it not, Danny? You go out here, okay, you don't have the black Amex card, but you're going to do some sensible shopping in this day and age where you go to the dry cleaner and a pair of slacks costs you like eight fifty for a pair of slacks. It's outrageous, right? Then, boom, all of a sudden, you got to be smart with your money. Feels pretty similar to the moves we saw from Awesome Fort last year. Those were more so one-year deals, and I think trying to patch up some holes from the roster he inherited. So this feels similar in a sense of... Again, not those big star players that you're bringing in as you're starting to look at not just the player evaluation, but the market valuation as well and what works for you, but bringing in players that fit the, fit what you are looking for from play on the field and also in the locker room. And it's very clear that they are going to stick with the philosophy they're saying, which is truly building your roster through the draft and using free agency as a supplemental piece for that. You know, you hear with defensive linemen, the two-man game. Is there a better pair of players more equipped right now than Justin Jones and Bilal no, Nichols, considering their not. background? That, right. that is a fantastic story, to be honest. Give it. To, can you do it in 30 seconds or less, Darren? Here we go, and you're on the clock. <laughs> I, I, I At one point, uh, Justin Jones mentioned that he was friends with Bilal Nichols, and I asked him how they came to know each other. Oh, no, the, he was talking about how they were friends because they had met at the Senior Bowl. And uh, I asked, so what was the response when you guys ended up both signing here? Like, how did that go down? 
and I ended up asking Nichols the same question. And, and they basically, they did not know the Cardinals were talking to the other guy. So uh, Justin Jones apparently, apparently reached out to Bilal Nichols and said, hey, I'm excited to be teammates with you finally. And Nichols was like, what are you talking about? And he goes, yeah, I just, I just agreed to a deal with the Cardinals. He's like, are you kidding me? So they didn't know until it all went down. And, and it, it is a great story. Uh, Nichols was came in late to the Senior Bowl uh, right before he came out for the draft. Justin Jones was the one who stepped up and, and helped him learn the playbook as quickly as possible, and they've remained really good friends. And, and now all of a sudden they're playing together on the same team. It was great because Bilal Nichols had that comment about uh, the mindset needed to play D-line, and he, he used a uh, very strong phrase that Craig Grigalu quoted exactly word for word. Yeah, but Craig didn't have enough swag with it. <laughs> That's right. So let's Danny, hear, let's hear your take, No, Paul. Danny, here we go. I'm no, set, Danny, I want Danny to do I'm it. I'm setting you up, Danny, You guys for were both sitting in the press conference. I just had to listen, so you guys I could just say monologue. it better than me. There you go. I have it, I I have it in bold Are right you there. If your you dad is going to be upset? Oh, a dramatic no. reenactment, Danny. You want to read it there? Where it's in bold. It's in bold right page there. of bold, No, it's right Paul. there in bold, the very bottom there. Bilal Nichols, Come on. you know, dramatic reenactment there. Mr. Rock, can you please yeah. read it into the record? Here we go. The whole thing? Yeah, just the bold Bilal player. Nichols, uh, when asked, I guess, about, was this what type of player or what kind of mindset the D-line's going to have? Yep. Want to be known as very physical D-line. Stop the run. He says, I want to bring in the mindset where the baddest mofos walking, period. No one out physicals us. That message, want to pass off to my teammates. That's the mindset. It is. A, I mean, I'm, I will say this. When you, when you hear all these guys talk and, like, you, you really get a good sense of, like, the people they are and why they would be JG type players, right? I mean, because that's that was the vibe they all kind of gave Same off. Same from Justin Jones too. Yeah, they, well, and 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 Mac Wilson. Right. And, I mean, obviously they're all a little bit different, but um, I, I think you you really get a sense of the guy, and and it it puts in more perspective what they're looking for in free agency, and and okay, you're maybe you're not going to notice these guys' names right away when you hear them. Um, and they're not necessarily going to be splashy. And every year that happens, uh, teams sign guys, and, and a lot of fans are like, I'm, I don't know who this guy is. But I, I think ultimately, I think that plays a huge part. they they got to be able to play. Obviously, they've done the scouting about the playing part. But I, I think the amount of time and the, the intentionality of getting players like this when you bring them in as a free agents has been very clear to me. Obviously, you can say the right thing. It's about your play. For me, when you're talking about defensive linemen in particular, where you're putting your hands on somebody and you're trying to get them to the dirt and it's it's rough every single play, I want to hear what I heard from a Justin Jones of saying, we're both hungry and only one of us is going to eat and I don't want to be the one to go hungry on every single rep. And that that mindset, that winning mindset, isn't just built and needed on Sunday. It's every single day in the weight room, the locker room, the cafeteria, what you're eating. All of that goes into Sunday. That's I, I want. I want a nasty defensive lineman yeah. on my team. That is what I want out of a D lineman. And that's what we have heard so far from Bilal Nichols and Justin Jones. And you see Justin Jones right there. His quote was, you got to be a mean SOB. It's a man's game, right? You got to understand people with families to take care of. And then he went on to your, what you quoted there. So yeah, that's the sort of mindset. What's intriguing to me, and I'd love to know the answer to this, and we'll never know, but is when JG says, you got to know, no before you invest in a player. How do you arrive at that conclusion that this is the sort of mindset, this is the sort of effort you're going to get out of a free agent you're bringing on board? So once again, I'd love to discover at some point what all goes into the current decision makers process in the Cardinals front office to you know, glean uh, you know, that this guy is worth investing in, that it's beyond just the measurables, beyond just the box score. you got to figure that out. Well, I mean, again, when, when we talk about these teams scouting players, all of them when they come out for the draft, this is when it comes into play. Not, and it wasn't how the whole decision was made, but these teams go back to when they drafted these guys coming out of college, when Bilal Nichols and, 
and uh, Justin Jones were at the Senior Bowl, and they have notes about what kind of people they are. So you kind of can start from there. Um, I'm sure with all the coaches on this staff, they've got contacts around the league. Players can vouch for them. You can ask players that are on this team that may have played with them. You can coaches can talk to other coaches. You get you get a better idea. See, to me, in free agency especially it's almost like you work backwards. Like, okay, let's try, and, and, and you've got to narrow down your, your scope of who you're looking at, obviously, but let's try and find the best guys first, and then we'll figure out if they play well enough for us to want to go after them. That's, that's how I would yeah. look at it. And look, there's a lot of attention and need for Justin Jones and Bilal Nichols. We all saw the rushing stats a year ago. Not kind, not good. You're in a division where you have Kyron Williams averaging seven yards a carry in the two games against the Cardinals when you lost to the Rams. We know what Christian McCaffrey and the Niners run game is all about, and then the two running backs in Seattle. The underrated guy in a lot of ways is Mac Wilson to me because when Kaiser White did go down and out those last seven games, wow. Cardinals had a tough time. I I agree with that. Had a tough time covering running backs in in pass routes, uh, tight ends. So Mac Wilson, who can really run, and he's a thumper. In fact, that was the quote I liked where he said, you know, Kaiser's a dog. He reminds me of me, a downhill thumper, a guy who can do it all, put me with a guy like Kaiser, and then he sort of gave that wry smile to the whole room, and he didn't finish the sentence. When I was talking to Mac a little bit before we started recording our interview in the studio, we are talking about all the different positions he has played. He's, You know, he hasn't just been – a one type of linebacker in his career. And he said, honestly, you could just call me a defender. Like I play mm. all over. You don't even need to call me a linebacker, call me a defender. I also did learn. <laughs> Was he, does he know Isaiah Simmons? <laughs> yeah, do you guys have your bingo card out? Because it looks like he's the new Isaiah. That's not on my card, <laughs> oh, Paul. It's on mine. Mac Wilson. You always do this. You always lead the witness, Darren. The ex, I'm sick of it. The X Factor, Max, Mac Wilson, who with a quarterback breaks the huddle, where is he? I also learned that, so Mac, when he was at Alabama, actually with Jonah Williams, they were at Bama together for three years, um, Mac played special teams and he was also on offense, a little bit of, I believe, fullback. Really? really? Yes. And then I oh. learned from him that he also has experience snapping the ball. <laughs> so, <Wow>. Okay. <laughs> a little bit of everything. Wow. I don't think we can expect to see him in an ideal world as the long snapper, hopefully. <laughs> And if you're killing some time on social media or YouTube, you can Google up what Jonah Williams said to look up his big hit on kickoff cover as a freshman at Alabama where he destroyed the return man. The hit heard around the world. I, I, I am fascinated to see. I mean, I think when they made those initial signings, it was Murphy Bunting and Jonah Williams that got the most attention because those are the one, those are the people the peop- that most fans have heard the most about. Uh, they've both been in, played in Super Bowls, Murphy Bunting winning one. Um, but these other guys, it's it's the three defenders that really kind of catch my eye with the two defensive linemen. Uh, and then as we're talking about Mac William, Wilson, because um, because I do think there can be I mean, I you do kind of imagine I, I'll be fascinated how they use Wilson, because the reality is, is your defense is going to be with one linebacker, one inside linebacker the vast majority of the time. Is it going to be Kaiser? Do they do they switch that up and they use Wilson and Kaiser more often? Uh, it'll, be, it'll be fascinating to see how they decide to do that. Craig Grealow, speak about uh, leading the witness. I don't know witness. him. Who's that? Leading the witness on Red Sea Report. He took me down the path of could the Cardinals go with a 4-3? Could the Cardinals show a 4-3 where it's Kaiser – it's Mac Wilson, and Zaven Collins is an off-the-ball linebacker again. That's intriguing. But at different times, you saw different alignments from Nick Rollis. We saw anything and everything all of last season. You saw four or five guys just walking around the trenches with nobody in a three-point stance. So I don't put anything past this coaching staff. If you indeed have that sort of personnel and you're going up against a run-heavy team, I could see that front seven, especially Zaven is excellent in coverage for the most part. And Mac Wilson, we know he can get out in the flat and he can cover guys out of the backfield and or tight ends. So that's something to watch, I think, in training camp. You know, what exactly did the Cardinals present? But as for Sean Murphy Bunning, he was really interesting when we had him in studio. 
and uh, you know, just asked him, okay, you mentioned in the media that Jonathan Gannon and Monty Osiford saw something in you that you see in yourself. What would you mean by that? And he said a guy who's a dog. He said a guy who, who can shut people down, a guy who has the ability to mix things up. I know some of the metrics for his man-to-man coverage – haven't been real kind. Maybe he's more of a zone cover corner. But in an ideal world, he's cornerback two. And he did say, and I asked him the question, where are they going to play you? And he said, they're going to play me on the outside, I believe. But obviously knowing that I have the flexibility to move inside. But he cited Garrett Williams as having an outstanding rookie season as a nickel corner. And he, he wants to play outside. Yeah, I, I, that feels That's very clear. clear. Yeah. 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 So... And it seems like he wants to continue to prove himself outside. Well, the, if you look at some of the analytics and the analysts, there was a lot of people that didn't feel like he had a great season playing outside last year. And the reality is, is I don't know if the Titans are loaded with cornerbacks. And They're they, not. And they let him walk. So yes. these that are is all the things, reality. These are all things you have to consider with this. And that that's nothing against Murphy Bunting. Um he seems like a fascinating guy, and I, and I, I do think he's going to come in here and look very uh, – he, he's going to make a, a very concerted effort to get to that level that he wants to be. If there's one guy in the free agency that I think Jonathan Gannon saw on film and said, got to have that guy, I just have a feeling it's Sean Murphy Bunting because that's JG's expert position, that he's coached as a position coach for mm-hmm. so long – I just get the sense after interviewing Sean Murphy Bunting on Big Red Rage and all of us knowing what Jonathan Gannon is about after one year that I would guess Murphy Bunting is JG's sort of corner, like his guy. Do you where do you think the cornerback room is right now? What do you think happens? That's my sleeper position in round one. I don't think there's enough talk about the Cardinals taking a corner. At the end of round one and maybe a tackle at the top of two. If, if you take wide receiver and you only end up with two first-round draft picks. Even if they do trade out of four, let's say let's go down to 11, which seems to be the uh, trade du jour right now with the Cardinals, I could see them going corner at 11 easily. If they go to if they go to 11, absolutely. If, if they go to 11, in my opinion, it's either a corner or an edge. That's what's going to happen. Because you can get s- such a – high quality tackle or wide receiver later or even even an interior defensive lineman still which is what a lot of the mock drafts have at 27 for the Cardinals still like a defensive tackle yeah possible I I just for some reason that's what's always I I agree with Paul I feel like if they don't go if they if they don't stay at four I feel like yeah it's going to be defense it's going to be edge or it's going to be corner depending on who's on the board at that point what about number six? What if you go down six? What if you go down two slots? A lot of noise around the Giants trying to move up for a quarterback. Would you go corner at six? Would you go edge at six? Those are two areas of dire need right now. I don't disagree, although I do think receiver is a need, a major need. Um, so if you're at six and – Let's say a Dunze is still there because neighbors went to the Chargers. Or no, I. Well, you, you if, figure the Chargers are going receiver at five. You figure, but two of those guys are still going to be there then because if somebody comes up, if the Giants come up, True. unless I don't see them coming up for a receiver nope. when they can stay at six and get one. So if they go up for a quarterback, then two of those receivers are still going to be there at six. Again, let there be a fourth QB. That's where this whole thing hinges. Well, let there be a fourth QB slash and make the Giants want him. <laughs> I agree that wide receiver is still such a high need that I think I would put that at six. I do like the idea of taking a cornerback or an edge if you move down to closer of that middle range of the first round. The, the Cardinals lost Hollywood Brown. He signed with the Chiefs on a one-year deal. I mean, right now you've got Michael Wilson. You've got Chris Moore I just feel like there's still such a drop off you you don't have that number one wide receiver and we got glimpses of that not just last year but also the year before with injuries of it can be a struggle when you don't have that true number one receiver and the Cardinals are desperately missing that at the moment I what what makes me pause when you talk about going corner at four or edge rusher at four or even six is and again, these teams are the ones trying to figure this out, but I have not seen anyone 
put any of those corners or any of those edge rushers in this spot where it's like this guy is going to be a guy for sure. Yeah. Everybody's still got question marks. The kid from uh, Alabama. Terry on Arnold. Arnold. I mean, he seems to be the top cornerback, but nobody's sitting here going, that's Revis Island all over again. No, he didn't run like Quinion Mitchell. Quinion and, Mitchell was 4-3. He was 4-5. And on the edge rushers, like Jared Verse was – he he's got tremendous physical talent, but he was lim- he only had so many sacks. Dallas Turner only had so many sacks. Nobody's saying Dallas Turner is another Will Anderson, so that's what would make me hesitate. Because now we're start talking about okay, there is a dire need for those positions here. You cannot reach. You know though, Danny, when you mention who's currently on the roster at receiver, it brings me back to my earlier question. How much do the current decision makers value the position? They got rid of Rondale Moore. They didn't re-sign Hollywood Brown. Look at the Chargers. We all know Jim Harbaugh's penchant for playing bully ball straight ahead run game. Cardinals dealt with it for many years in the division when Jim Harbaugh was the head coach of the 49ers. What did he do? He cut Mike Williams and they said, see you later to Keenan Allen. And they have zero in the receiver room right now as well. I think you could argue the opposite. The Cardinals, and not just this staff, but previous staff as well, was having a hard time finding the best way to utilize Rondale Moore. And we talked about it many times. What you could get out of Rondale Moore, you were getting out of Greg Dortch. And the Cardinals made the decision to tender Dortch. I don't think it was a bad deal to make a trade to send Moore to Atlanta and get Desmond Ritter as a backup quarterback because we saw what happened when Clayton Toon had a start in Cleveland last year. Unless he has taken monumental steps since that game and throughout this early part of the offseason, you were desperately missing, you were needing, not missing, but you were needing a backup quarterback that, heaven forbid, you have to use in a game because something happens with Kyler Murray that you can go and, and trust that they can lead your team to success. I don't think many people could sit here and say as confidently that Clayton Toon can do that as well as Desmond Ritter. I don't think that means that they don't value or prioritize the wide receiver position. I think, if anything, it's having the understanding of, okay, we probably really like, I would assume they probably liked Rondo Moore, but you weren't getting the most out of that. And so you did what was best there. I, I, I think that you can make the opposite argument of what you were saying of valuing a wide receiver. And I think that seeing the troubles that they had, I would imagine it is a high value, especially when you're looking at the quality of these draft picks. When it comes to Hollywood Brown, I sat here many times and said, I would love to see him sign here on a one-year deal. He has said he wants to be here. It's very likely that the Cardinals tried to get him to sign here. Can we honestly sit here and say that choosing the Cardinals over the Chiefs with Patrick Mahomes and their Super Bowl runs and what he's able to do that it was an, it would have been an easy choice to stay with the Cardinals because he liked the organization and was playing with his best friend from college and as his quarterback. I mean, I, I can't sit here and say that I blame Hollywood yeah. for going and signing a one-year deal with the Chiefs. So again, that to me doesn't say that they don't value a wide receiver. I think it makes a lot of sense for Hollywood to go sign that deal with KC. Uh, for, for me, I, I would also say, I mean, I guess we'll know the way this draft plays out of how they really feel about it. And until then we'll, we'll just have to debate it. Um, I, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure if Rondell Moore was on this roster going into training camp, that he was going to be on it when the regular season started. Whoa. Wow. I, I, I just don't, I, 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 I kind of see that we're talking about a smaller receiver. They don't want small receivers and they had too many of them. Hollywood was also small and, Oh, and, and but, neither one is great at blocking. Which That's, they value a lot in okay. receivers. And final point on that, which we've already talked about with the free agents coming in. I love Hollywood, but what was one thing he wasn't in his two years? Durable. Durable. I I just I, I think it has less to do with the position and more to do with who they had at the position with the changes that they're trying to make. I no longer play fantasy football, but if I do this year, I'm drafting Hollywood Brown with Patrick Mahomes. I just am. Yeah, they missed him. I mean, someone asked me about Josh Dobbs, and I just rerun in my head how many times Josh Dobbs missed Hollywood Brown down the field. That's fair. Yeah. By the way, speaking of backup quarterback now, Desmond Ritter. 
Darren, any thoughts? Desmond Ritter, he's going to turn 25 in August, round three, two years ago. I know a lot of fans that I saw were like, oh, geez, you could have given up a sixth round and get Justin Fields. Well, hello, he's going to be due $25 million next year because he was the 11th pick overall. So you and, know, and you're he, only paying Desmond Ritter just over a million this year and next year. And you're not getting Justin Fields to come in here and be a backup to a guy that, again, you need a backup because guys do get hurt. But your plan is for Kyler Murray to take every snap this year, and then you would have a guy that would never play. I don't get the sense Justin Fields would be all that great. The, the reporting out of Chicago on Justin Fields was he wanted to go be a stealer. And one of the reasons he wanted to be a stealer, even after Russell Wilson got it, because he thinks he's going to have a chance to play. That would not be here. Uh, that just seems stupid yeah. to me. Why do people say that stuff? You know what was interesting? Matthew Stafford went on a rant with Rich Eisen this week where he said that the NFL is pulling the plug on these quarterbacks way too soon. Oh, Louis, uh, uh, Louis Riddick kind of ranted on that a little bit uh, on Twitter. I think it was today. might have been yesterday, but I think it was this morning. Um, basically saying, at what point do we start looking at these coaching staffs who are unable to develop these guys and unable to adapt – to what they have because not all of these quarterbacks should be busting. This is on coaches. Because if you look at that 2021 draft, four of the five, you can consider bust right now with the exception of Trevor Lawrence, number one overall. And he hasn't been great. And there were five in the top 15, and you figure there's going to be four in the top 10 at this rate this year. So what's the future of all these rookie quarterbacks this year if teams are going to pull the plug after a season and a half? Like, for example, Desmond Ritter. How do you really know what he's capable of? Obviously, through some bad turnover, some bad picks. He yeah. had some. He had some bad decisions that he made. But again, Matthew Stafford went on a rant saying, "Hey, that's life as an NFL quarterback. Your first two years. In fact, yes. I wouldn't even make a judgment or a declaration on a guy's future until after year three. Well, that's great. Except the owner won't stand for that. He won't. The coach isn't going to stand for that because he's probably going to get fired." And you want to know who else doesn't stand for it? And they're as equally part of the problem? The fans. Yeah. Like, you don't – who's who's willing and, to give and, that And the way? media, us. Oh, and the media. Matthew Stafford threw You're Rich right. Eisen I'll, under I'll the bus, too, but which like, is funny. The run, there is no runway here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some They were making the point – I mean, back, you know, back when we were young, Paul – very young, yeah. the NFL, the part, the and there was no free agency. What you the you actually had this was a real thing, which is almost hilarious to think back to now. When you drafted a quarterback in the NFL, the conventional wisdom is you sat him his first four or five years before he played. What? Oh yes, that was a thing for a long time. 4 or 5 years. Yeah, you would sit. We want you should be sitting for 4 or 5 years, watch this guy learn how to play the game, then you play. Now, there was no free agency, so no one could go anywhere and, unless the team wanted you to. And 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 B, you had it was a smaller there were I mean, fewer teams, not tremendously fewer, but there were fewer teams, so there were more a few more quarterbacks to go around. But yeah, it was uh, you. If you read the stuff about you know quarterbacks coming in, and I'm talking a while ago. I'm talking about like you're talking about the 50s and 60s, and then early 70s. Now I'm not saying everybody did it, but that was like the perfect thing. And and then um, we got to a point where it's like now you can't sit at all, and it's 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 really crazy. And you look at how much it benefited Aaron Rodgers to sit for three years. How much it benefited Carson Palmer just to sit one year? I mean, Carson Palmer, can you imagine Carson Palmer, the number one overall pick of the Bengals, comes in perfectly healthy, and they're like, yeah, John Kitten is going to play all year. I mean, that, it wasn't the number one overall pick, but that was the plan here. They drafted Matt Leiner, and he was supposed to sit that whole season, and Kurt Warner was going to be the quarterback. Kurt Warner did the same thing, allegedly, in New York. And, and what happened? Now, Kurt played poorly that early year with Leinert, Leinert, so he kind of earned, quote-unquote, uh, the benching, so Leinert goes in. But, like, with Eli Manning and Kurt Warner in, in the Giants, Kurt had a had the Giants, a, not a great Giants team, with, like, a they were 5-4 and four after they lost here, and he took, like, six sacks against the Cardinals and, and looked poor. 
And yeah. then they benched him, and they, they said, you know what, we're putting Eli in, and we're not going to, because nobody can wait anymore. The only recent example would be Jordan Love. Yeah. He was the end of the first round 2020. It's worked out kind of well then. And think about it. He sat those first three years. And look at the sort of ball that he played in the playoffs in the postseason. I was shocked. I don't know about you guys. Watching Jordan Love, he had some really poor moments his first year or two when he got a little bit of playing time here and there. He looked totally unequipped. The game looked way too big for him, way too fast for him. And he was out there slicing and dicing the 49ers in that playoff game. And, and, And let's also make very clear, dear Matthew Stafford, that in, 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 in addition to the owner and the coaches and probably the GM and the media and the fans, you know who also doesn't uh, won't stand for a rookie quarterback sitting very long? The rookie quarterback. They get pissed when they're sitting. They get angry when they don't get to play. The fact that Caleb Williams is already wanting yes. to have stake in the team. Like, I mean, what do we – we can we can talk about these guys getting – not the right kind of backup to no. become good guys, but it's it's everywhere and it's at all levels and it's the players too. I I guarantee you, there's no rookie quarterbacks going. You know what? I think I should sit this year. Okay, so who, who currently has the best backup quarterback in the NFC West? Niners have Josh Dobbs. Rams just signed Jimmy G. Seattle went Suspended after Jimmy G. Well, that's true. Seattle went after Sam Howell. And now the Cardinals have Desmond Ritter. Danny, Ooh, that's that's good. Darren, one. interesting power pole right now. That's a good one. I my I originally I go to think between probably Dobbs and Ritter. I'm I'm after the suspension. I would still go with Jimmy G. I'd go Jimmy right, but G. But he's suspended. We're not taking that into account. No, well, I mean no. Jimmy okay. G. I'd say Jimmy G. One, Desmond Ritter two. I'd say Josh Dobbs three, Sam Howell four. Wow. Okay. That's what I go. I mean okay. this in the nicest way possible, but I mean Josh Dobbs for three games. Yeah, how four many games? I, no. <laughs> yeah, there is a shelf life when he comes in. You, you, you're right about that. So, um, by the way, if you're wondering, in terms of numbers and uh, former players, the last four draft classes prior to Monty Austinfort. Of the 32 players the Cardinals selected, 19, 20, 21, and 2022, six total players remain. Shall we take a guess? Not a guess, but work through it off the top of our heads. Wait, wait, so, Since 19. There's there's one player from the 19 class. It's Kyler. Yes. There's, I'm going to save you, zero players from the 20 class yeah. because Lucky Foto yeah. is now a New York Jet. Who was, who was, was that Isaiah 2020? Yes. Okay. Yes. That was before I got here. And then 2021, a seven-player class, 21. Dima KG is one. Zavin is the other. Rondell Moore traded. Right. And now you have three players left from the 22 class. Cam Thomas. Trey McBride. Trey McBride. Yep. And one more. Special teams guy off the edge. Former Penn Stater. Canadian. Oh, Lucetta. Jesse Lucetta. So there you go. So... We've talked about it. Hitting the big red reset button. It has happened. It has officially happened. Well, Monty Austin Ford. You're getting into year two with a new group. It was yeah. almost inevitable. Yeah. So I just thought that was uh, really interesting as to uh, where exactly the Cardinals stand right now. Uh, past, present, and future as you uh, are a month or so out from the draft. So uh, as for that, let's see. What else, Danny? Anything else out there? Oh, speaking of uh, options, I'm going to throw this out at the very end. I need your opinion. Casa VC has a brand new dog. Mm. Yes! Two. We're trying to decide on a name. Do you think I should launch my first ever Twitter poll with the five finalists for the name of the dog? Yes, but oh, I think yeah. for Twitter, I think you can only do up to four. Yeah, four? Yes. Do four. Okay. Why so don't gonna... you share them with the listeners? Because so I know how I feel. The given name from the... Oh, uh, you've heard these already? Here, yes. Well, here, the you given have to give name, a little bit of background. So Paul and his family rescued a dog It's a weekend. chihuahua slash wiener dog mix. But the body is more of a chihuahua. This is important stuff to know for Th- a name, Paul. Think of the Taco Bell dog. Almost a dead ringer for the Taco Bell dog some oh, 20 years I ago. I missed that guy. Okay. Danny wasn't born yet. So, <laughs> That's sweet. So the given name, the given name by the Kent, by the rescue place was Marty. Marty. Which is cute. I'm like, that's pretty funny. I like that. You know, it kind of rolls off the tongue. Right. Then we named him Frankie. Which yeah. I like. Okay. And then, uh, as I explained to Craig Grillo, I was watching uh, this movie, and there was the name Poncho. 
which means free or freedom in Spanish. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then we went with Pico because he's small. I like Pico. Pico's a good one. Although I've been told that really Pico in Spanish is more commonly means an edge, like to like a knife or something, an edge. And now we've arrived at Cheeto. Boo. <laughs> Danny's Sorry if your kids very, are listening. Wait, is this, I don't is like this the name dog Cheeto. already in your house? The dog's in the yes. house. Uh, it's, his head's got to be spinning. <laughs> We're on day four. Believe me. They, it, saying, we, pick, a dog. A, pick a lane. No, when, 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 when the dog is in our presence, it's just that dog or the four-legged friend. I okay. haven't really gone with a name yet. So uh, Here's, you know. I told Paul what's going to happen because yeah. Paul grew up with cats and he was outvoted three to one on the dog, as I said, within the yes. next, I said five. It's probably closer to two or three years. Paul is going to be the most attached to this dog and also vice versa because that's how it works. The dad doesn't want the dog and then the dog the dog and the dad love each that, other the that most. Would be, yeah. If you put Cheeto on that list, it's going to win. So you don't want that. Just like you don't want to put but that's the name Bodie McBoat face. <laughs> Wait a minute. What? What's Bo- Where does that go? How do I know that? How do I know well, that? Just Google Bodie McBoat face okay. and you'll realize right. why you don't I'm gonna want Cheeto. I'm going to tell you, oh, okay. I'm not voting for yeah. Cheeto on Twitter. I see. Yeah. Uh, before we go... Uh-oh. We got to give a shout out to Ray, who wrote us a very nice letter. <laughs> okay. And so we're That's giving right. Ray, yeah, send who, us who's fan got mail. very nice handwriting. He wrote us a nice letter about how much he appreciates our show. So we want to say... Good luck, Ray. Nice. Okay. That's great. No, that's that's really good. Um, anything about the brand new innovative luxury field level seating at State Farm Stadium, Ooh. which has created quite the buzz this week? Those will not be my two season tickets, I'm fairly certain. The casitas, yeah. the Danny, clubs they have, the field suites and the field seats. I mean, Pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty nice. Look Paul's, at this. Paul's going to be, you know, Paul normally roams the sideline for radio during the game. We're going to take a look, and Paul's going to be yeah. on the, one of the roofs of the casitas just enjoying a nice drink, hanging out with some Cardinals fans, Danny, you reporting spend, on the game from a casita. Do that anyway? You spend your share of time on the sideline. You're going to be involved with that as well. <laughs> I think there's a new rule. Remember, Nick Saban used to tell the media, new rule, right in the middle of a press conference. New rule, if the Cardinals have a three-touchdown lead, then the sideline reporter gets to go in for happy hour. That's what hey. I'm thinking. Just vault the wall, go in, get a nice cold beverage, come back out, you know, that stroll. the fancy. How solid would that be, though, if you're strolling the sideline with a microphone in one hand and a cold beverage from the Cardinals casita in the other? That would Not be solid. Bad. Yeah, that would be good. I mean, look at that. Well, not everybody can look at it if they're listening to us on the podcast. Yeah. Only go check out YouTube. our social media yes. channels. You can see the yes. renderings. Go see it. Really well done. Really well done. I mean, beyond innovative. That's really cool. I we can call you Cheeto. <laughs> that's it. Those, I shall call him Pico. No, that's okay. Pequeno? See, okay, here we go. Those, <laughs> then we're fighting words right there, and that'll bring to an end this edition of Cardinals Underground, brought to you by Pacific Office Automation. No slander.